Hello friends, host Eric here, host of Talking with Famous People, and author of Gospel of the Pantheon. It was a hundred thousand million years ago, things were really slow, nobody else yet to show, place the slabs below, and plant them so, the plan can start to go. More years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go more years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slaps come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet yeah, to show Place the slabs below Okay, so here we go on to the second verse of chapter three of the novel I'm going to actually say a little bit of a pre-disclaimer here, which is, for those of you watching it, thank you very much. Again, I appreciate comments and stuff on my novel videos just as much I've discovered as I do on my music. Um, so I really appreciate any kind of feedback from anybody. But second of all, let me just say, this chapter that we're currently reading and the next chapter, in my opinion, are... I guess this is it's like things start to really roll along after the next chapter so if you're kind of still waiting for shit to start happening um, I've lost people in this section of the book before <laughs> I'd say if you can tough it out through the end of the next chapter then everything starts happening so I had to let set up a certain amount of exposition here at the beginning anyway Enough disclaimer. Uh, the rest of this chapter is short. Verse 2 of chapter 3. The Duchess had been proved wrong. She had been come... <laughs> Verse 2, chapter 3. The Duchess had been proved wrong. She had become utterly gratefully submissive, overjoyed just to be in the God's company. She had been willing to do anything to please, but the God had told her to just sit there and wait. She had thanked him for telling her what to do. Now came the ugly part. And Tropotropocles muted his divinity until it was almost completely contained, just as it had been before the test. Now came the begging and the sobbing. Now came the, You son of a bitch! screamed the Duchess. What did you do to me? Well, I, uh, stammered the god. This was completely unexpected. The mortal had recovered, just as he had hoped she would, but it had not taken her days nor even hours, to do so. It had taken one minute. I despise you, she hissed at him. I despise you and your so-called divinity. There's nothing more than parlor magic, and you will pay, deity. Make no mistake about that. You will pay. Have you forgotten about our deal, Duchess? asked the god, finding himself quite unexpectedly on the defensive. And, indeed, the Duchess had forgotten. Her venom was purely reflexive. The woman's will was so great, and her unwillingness to defer so complete, that when the god retracted his power enough for her to realize what was going on, she had been consumed not by anguish, but instead by a crescendo of rage, and this rage had occupied her to the exclusion of all other thoughts. Well, she began. The Duchess took a moment to compose herself. She turned away from the god, took several deep breaths, and waited until she had steadied. The noble woman reminded herself of her top priority, pass the test, and to pass she needed to display composure. She absolutely loathed this devil, of course, and she would not forget the humiliation she had just suffered, but there would be time for that later. Right now, she had immortality to attain. She turned back around and faced the god. Ahem. Yes, the deal. Forgive my outburst, god. I did consent to that experience, so although it was nothing short of the most filthy violation I've ever endured, I suppose I cannot accuse you of rape. No, I suppose you cannot, Odd. Though I took no advantage of your eagerness to serve me, you are right, Duchess. A violation is precisely what it was. It is most notable that you view it as such. Call it what you will, God, but we have business to attend to. 
As you see, I'm composed, and I feel quite myself. I believe the criteria you set forth require that I recover from the ordeal completely and quickly. Do you agree that I have done so? Duchess, said the god, you have exceeded my wildest expectations. Then give me what is mine, demanded the woman. Of course, said the immortal. You remember all the details of our arrangement, I'm sure, and I'm confident you will fulfill your end of the bargain when the time comes. I will do what I have agreed to, God. It is a very fair price for what I am getting in return. The God nodded and stood and picked up the bone from the table. Come stand before me, then, Duchess, and take off your shirt. The Duchess hesitated. Do you think I am now trying to trick you into showing me your breasts, woman? It is necessary that you take off your shirt, so take it off. She saw no lechery in the God's eyes, so she gave him a hard look, but did as he instructed. And Tropotropocles held the bone against the woman's chest with the palm of his hand. This might hurt a bit, he chuckled. Then, abruptly, the god pushed the bone through the young woman's ribcage and into her heart. The whole of the duchess's body clenched up in a half-begun sob, and agony spread from her chest to the rest of her body. Blood gushed from the wound. The duchess was certain she would die. But then the wound closed, and the ribs mended, and the flesh grew back, leaving only a small scar where the bone had entered beneath the blood that had already dried and begun to flake away. And she felt just as she had before, in very short order. She felt no difference at all. See you later, Duchess. When you alone rule this land, I expect my cathedral to be your top priority. And then he was gone. The Duchess smiled back at the empty space where the god had been. That could be easily thirty years, she quietly said. She already ruled New Hamptonshire. Her father was just a useful figurehead, and given the circumstances, she decided he would remain precisely that for as long as he lived. But Entropotropocles had known full well who really ruled New Hamptonshire, and the god had lied to the duchess when he had described himself as patient. The duke died that very night. I'm going to go ahead and I guess do chapter four, first first book probably, uh, since that was fairly short. Chapter 4. Luciano Visits the Villa. Verse 1. In 1765, Campago Relegati married. He was in his 80s, but was still a vibrant fellow, or at least he was vibrant enough to father a son. Very little had changed in New Hamptonshire over the course of the 65 years since Campago had visited the villa and collected the finger bones of the god of time. The Duchess, for example, still looked hardly a day older than sixteen, though, given her actual age, she ought to have appeared as wizened as Campago himself. One thing that had changed, though, was that now there was a massive cathedral in the center of Hamptonshire City. And before I get to Campago's wedding, I'd like to go back to 1728, to the day of the cathedral's opening. Nearly everyone in the city, including Campago Relighetti, gathered in front of the Grand Cathedral to hear the Duchess explain what the building was and to perhaps catch a glimpse of the inside of it. During the Duchess's speech, right after she had begun, in fact, a figure appeared out of nowhere at the door of the church, just behind and to the side of the noblewoman. Campago, who was close to the front of the crowd, Campago was close to the front of the crowd, and he saw the figure and recognized him as Curtis, the god of text and of naming things. Curtis! Hello, Curtis! Campago had shouted out. He waved both arms vigorously in hopes that the god would see him and remember him from the villa. Curtis turned around to see who was calling him, and he spotted Elegetti. Campago, what a surprise to see you. It never occurred to me you might be here today, but of course it makes sense. You live in New Hamptonshire. And Relegetti smiled and gave the god a thumbs up. Though the god had apparently spoken to Campago at a normal volume, the voice of the immortal carried across the crowd, and later many people asked Campago how he had come to know the god. But Campago was somewhat embarrassed by the attention, and he was not inclined to answer any questions about it. Being greeted by the god nevertheless made Relegetti a minor celebrity amongst the groundskeepers and other staff. People still asked him about it years later. Regardless, nearly everyone in the crowd heard Curtis, and it was soon established that it had been a god who had spoken. This sparked much excitement. Everyone wanted to see the immortal. Even the Duchess stopped talking and turned around. So there were many eyes upon Curtis when the god stood before the two huge oaken doors of the church and raised his hands, and there were therefore many who saw the god burn deep into the stone above the door the following words, The Church of Squalor. Thus did Entropotropocles' church come to be called the Church of Squalor, and thus did his priests come to be known as the Clergy of Squalor. 
Now let's get back to Kimpongo's wedding. By 1765, it had become the law of the land that all weddings be squalid ones, and the Grand Cathedral was within easy walking distance of Campago's quarters, so it was in the cathedral that Relegetti, at the age of 83, was married. It had taken Campago decades to become prosperous enough to entice a young woman to marry him, and then it had taken him several more years to save enough to afford the ceremony, and Relegetti knew that upon committing the funds to the service, he might not even get what he paid for. In a wedding service in the Church of Squalor, you see, one ran the very real risk of being married to the wrong person, as there were blindfolds and a full day's worth of intoxicant consumption involved. But in the end, Campago was lucky. He managed to walk out of the church a happy old man with the exact young bride he had intended to marry, and within a year, his son, Luciano Relighetti, was born. Luciano was much like his father, but he was less practical. The boy spent his time carving figurines out of wood, and he showed little interest in learning the family business of keeping the grounds of the Duchess's estate. For all of his childhood and on into adolescence, Luciano was able to work on his carvings. Nothing gave Campago as much joy as seeing the wooden creations that his son made, for Luciano did excellent work, and the old man proudly displayed each completed piece in their shared quarters. Mrs. Relighetti had died giving birth to Luciano, so all that Campago and his son had were each other and the wooden figures to keep them company. When Luciano was fourteen, he had a conversation with his father one morning as the old man got ready for work. "'When will I begin working, father? I'm the last one of my friends not yet to work,' said the boy. "'You work, Luciano,' answered Campago as he laced his boots. "'You work very hard.' "'I don't understand,' said his son. "'That is your work,' said Campago, pointing to Luciano's carvings. "'It's true, father, that I work on those.' But they earn us no money at all. They require work, but I don't see how they can be my work. How they can be my work. The elder Relegetti, who sat upon the edge of his bed, straightened out his back and looked up at his son. He placed his hands on his knees and thought about what his son had said. When I'm finished keeping the grounds, the old man finally said, I have nothing to show for it. Things may look a little nicer, but the grounds that I keep are not even my own. How can that be my work? Luciano considered this for a few minutes. Y you do have something to show for it. You have money to show for it, he said. Campago sighed. Money's a lot like keeping the ground. So I pull the weeds and they're gone. Then the rains come and the weeds grow back, and I pull them again. That's not work. That's maintenance. And money's the same way. I earn the money, I buy the food, the money's gone, I earn it again. That's not something to show for anything. That's maintenance. Luciano looked unconvinced. Do you understand? asked Campago. I think so, said Luciano, but I'm not sure I agree. I'm pretty sure the other groundskeepers don't think that way. It's impossible to know what other people think, said the old man. We can only hear what they say, and people choose the words they say for lots of different reasons. They don't necessarily choose them wisely, because once spoken words just melt into the air. Campago rose creakily to his feet. The old man's boots were tightly laced, and now he was ready to go. So, just as he did each morning, right before he left the quarters, Campago used his calloused hands, stained copper by the earth, to flatten out the wrinkles from his clothing. On this morning, though, he then looked at those stained hands and rubbed them together and faced his son. But when you do work, son, you have something when you're done, something that does not melt away, something that you can point to and say, that's my work, and people will know what you've done. Luciano nodded and watched his father open the door and settle the broad-brimmed hat he wore atop the few gray hairs that remained on his head. Just before Campago stepped outside, a question occurred to the boy. What is your work, father, if not keeping the grounds? Campago sighed and smiled. You're my work, Luciano. I can point to you and say, that's my son. I can point to those coverings and say, that's my son's work. So it was that Campago provided for his son to give the boy time to carve. Each morning, the old man would go out to his day of labor, tending to the gardens all around the manor house where the Duchess lived. And each morning, Luciano would take his knives and a piece of wood, and he would sit in front of the quarters and chip away. These happy years would not last. The dukedom, after all, was a rather backwards place. Luciano's father was a groundskeeper, and therefore Luciano would be one as well. But for the moment, the young man was able to put off that fate and work on his art. One day, when Luciano was seventeen and Campago was just a few days shy of the hundred and first birthday, the elder Relegetti told his son something that he had kept secret for over eighty years. Campago had never really understood why he had kept the story secret, but he did understand that now it was time to tell it. The old man told of the visit he had made long ago to the villa. He included every detail he could recall, and he told it as accurately as he could, and entreated his son to listen carefully and remember it. 
and then he gave his son the sack containing the bones of the god of time. Luciano, for his part, wasn't sure what to make of the story. He believed his father, assuredly, and he found the tale interesting, but Luciano did not know what meaning, if any, he ought to take from the account. Regardless, the boy made an oath to his father that day, an oath that Campago insisted he make. Luciano swore to keep the bones of the god of time secret and safe, and to pass them on to his own son, just as Campago had passed them on to Luciano. The next day, Campago Relegati died while feeding the fish that lived in the pond on the east side of the manor house. Verse 2. So I'm going to stop it right there. For That's about a good length for a video. Um, 15 minutes or so. Hope you're enjoying the book. Thanks for your patience as I get everything set up here. I've got the rest of this chapter and then things are going to start moving along plot-wise. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for watching, and here's the theme song, and goodbye. It was a hundred thousand million years ago, things were really slow, nobody else yet to show, place the slabs below, and plant them so, the plan can start to go. More years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slabs come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show Place the slabs below And plant them so The plan can start to go more years into when tears gnashing through Oh holy slabs come into view At last holy result from two into A regal history that demanded you The dread that's ever new It was a hundred thousand million years ago Things were really slow Nobody else yet to show